Can you guys hear me in the back? All right? Fantastic. Uh, so, as was mentioned, I'm the author of a book called Legally Kidnapped, The Case Against Child Protective Services. I'm also the host of a show called the Libertarian Atheist Podcast, and I work with the Free State Project. So normally I start these speeches by talking about guilt, guilt that I had for working for Child Protective Services as an investigator. Guilt for tearing apart families time and time again, having fathers go against mothers, mothers going against their own children. And for working for an agency that controlled directly over 400,000 children in America. And when I bring up that number, what should also be thought of is the statistics on what is going on with those children in those homes. They are seven to eight times more likely to be physically or sexually abused than children in impoverished households. 50% will end, end up homeless whenever they leave. They're three times more likely to be put on psychotropic drugs that have never been tested on children and are used as guinea pigs time and time again. And most tragically, they're six times more likely to die than if they stayed in an impoverished household. When I bring up those numbers, the thought that's brought up is, well, there are plenty of terrible parents out there, and that is true. But only 20% of removals in those foster homes are for physical or sexual abuse. The vast majority are for negligence, and about 40% are for marijuana use. Not even necessarily proven, but just accused. But that guilt that I brought up in the past has subsided. It's subsided because I've worked with hundreds if not thousands of families to try and reunite fathers with their children, mothers with their children, parents put together. What does drag me down though is the justifications by people who regularly defend child protective services. And in truth, every single one of those bastards has blood on their hands. It's not just because of the money that's paid for, because the money barely even matters. It's all made up out of thin air. It's the mindset. It's the mindset that there are individuals out there who are angels, who will go against all the monetary incentives provided by CPS and the state. It's a mindset that the government can ever possibly be good, and that the ends justify the means. These people apparently, once you start to realize what it means to work for the government, you have to believe these people are angels. Because they will never lie, they will never cheat, they will read the entire contract before agreeing to that iTunes agreement, they will never sleep, they will never fuck, they will never act unethically. But once you start acknowledging the limitations of human beings, our inability to truly decipher fact and fiction in times of great stress, the stupid ways in which we conceptualize on the fly in order to be able to deal with the world that we're living in. Once you realize the fact that the people putting individuals in gas chambers have the same brains as them, that is when you start to be able to be free and move forward. To kind of put this preaching into context, I'd like to talk a little bit about myself and how I ended up working for Child Protective Services. When I was in college, I was some musician, atheist, anarchist who thought he was a badass even though I was going for a mediocre degree in sociology. And I had started listening to people like Stefan Molyneux who were bringing up the fact that the way we raised our kids had a direct correlation about how the adults that are going to be in our society. So I ended up doing an internship interviewing and doing counseling with molested kids and actually talking to child molesters. It took about every single bit of power in my body to not jump over the table and choke these people to death. But after a while, you start to learn how to take away your emotions when you're discussing with these people. Nevertheless, I thought truly that what I was doing, although we were helping individuals, I had to go out there and actually stop abuse head on. Now, I didn't want to be a cop because they kill brown people. I didn't want to be a soldier because they kill brown people. But I remember being in situations where I'd actually stopped people from hitting their own kids in public and been assaulted for it. And I remember being told by a cop that, well, Child Protective Services is here to stop that abuse. So I decided to go ahead and fill out a form to state, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and give this Child Protective Service thing a shot. Now, when I first went ahead and sent in my resume, I ended up getting a form sent back to me, basically a, a statement of intent that I will not be a psychopathic person, that I am to be trusted, and a slight criminal background check. After about two months of training, I was a CPS investigator. I had the power to go into people's homes, schools, anywhere where children resided because according to Child Protective Services in every single state within the United States, the state owns the child. The parent does not. The term is called parents portray. I was given the power to change lives through force. They called it guiding with a caring hand. I was told to manipulate others. 
They called it finding truth through questioning. I was told to use unscientific, fraudulently corrupt tactics. They called it eyewitness testimony, lie detection, lie detection, and monitoring society for the betterment of child development. Typical state double speak. The people I worked with, there's this thing that's always brought up. These people have the greatest intentions. They're hard workers. They're not paid. It's mostly bullshit. They're standard bureaucrats with semi-good intention Christians who look down on others. They justify their rationality and corruption through the moniker, we're trying our best, which society always propagates. They would complain about their wages and pensions even though they were getting paid way more than they ever should have. And they lived a life of complete comfort for the most part whenever they got home. They sent their kids to public school and then whenever they'd go home they'd watch five to six hours of television and rinse and repeat. They were standard Americans. These were not heroes. The culture though, the memes they exemplified and propagated were the same ones that most of society says. Things were safe from when we were kids. People who smoke pot are bad. If you do not hit your children, they'll end up being spoiled brats. Homeschooled kids are weird. Libertarians are trying to hide things. And there's child molesters everywhere. The agency coercively kept the terrible norms of society progressing without ever defining what those norms are supposed to be and without ever reflecting on the truth. The way our investigation started was well, I guess it kind of exemplifies what was really going on here. So, someone would make a phone call to Child Protective Services regarding an alleged abuse. That abuse could be that the kid's being homeschooled, that he's playing outside for too long. I actually had cases where I had to interview seven to eight different adults because a kid was allowed to ride his bike two blocks away just to be able to close the case and my supervisor was fighting for removal. It could be that the kid is too fat, too thin, and rarely in some cases it was for actual abuse. but the accused would never know the name of the accuser, which, as anyone knows, is actually unconstitutional. And what I found after my research, after getting out of Child Protective Services, was that CPS broke the first, second, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and fourteenth amendments in their normal day-to-day -day processes. Now, when we get that abuse called in, the first thing we're supposed to do is actually talk to the child and not to the parent. Again, we own the kids. So we usually go to their public school in order to be able to talk to them. I'm going to move this microphone just a little bit more so I'm not crap. There we go. Let's see. All right. And that's not working on. Okay, that's a little bit better. So we would go out to their public school and I want you to kind of think about a scenario in your mind real quick. You're four or five years old, you just started school, you have a group, a random aggregate of individuals all being told what to do, what to think, what to eat, and when you can use the bathroom. You have an adult telling you who to do that, who you've never actually met, and you're just taken away from your parents. You're in a pretty stressful spot. Oh, by the way, your neurofrontal cortex hasn't adapted enough to be able to deal with the stresses of day-to-day -day life. But some asshole like myself goes ahead and walks in and says, hi, I'm a Child Protective Services investigator. I'd like to ask you a series of questions. How many of those words do you think he knows? Maybe two, maybe three, but I am an adult and I'm supposed to be respected. So I take this kid, bring him into a back room. Hi, my name is Carlos. Um, today I'm going to be asking you a series of questions in regards to your parents or potential abuse, but before we start here, would you mind consenting by saying yes, by saying yes, by saying yes to an interview real quick? What does that kid say? Anyone? Yes, because he wants to make people happy. Because guess what? He's evolved to the point where if you don't say yes or listen to adults, well, evolutionarily, um, you'd end up eating the wrong berry and dying when you used to be a caveman. So a five-year-old is capable of consent, but people who drink are not. Logic. So we'd ask them a series of puff questions. What's your favorite color? What's your favorite thing to do? Do you like going outside? These are supposed to relax the kid. It never works. His ass is holes like this tight. He's just freaked out. Oh my God, what's going on? Am I in trouble? You have to keep saying he's not in trouble. And then ask him the hard questions. How often do you touch your father's penis? How often are you allowed outside? How often are you hit by your parents? You guys know what the term leading question means? It means that the, there's already an assumption of the answer embedded into the question. The only way you can answer it is through guilting yourself. That is actually what we did. And we scared the hell out of them. I was dealing with a case a while back uh, in North Carolina. This uh, dad had spent about $200,000 on lawyer fees. He was told by CPS investigators that he was molesting his child. 
and I went ahead and I talked about this. I was trying to figure out exactly what was going on. I said, you know, could you do, do me a favor? Could you go ahead and get a recording of the interview? Because all the interviews are supposed to be recorded. He spent $200,000 already on attorney fees. He goes, wow, they, they record that? Awesome. They got the court recording. Um, does your dad touch your penis? What? Does, does your dad touch your penis? No. Well, whenever you, um, whenever you take a shower, do you, does he like wash you? Yes. Okay, if, uh, dad, dad touches penis. That fucking kid got removed from his home for six months where he was regularly abused. All because that son of a bitch decided to lie. The court case was immediately thrown out and he got his kids back. And some people thought of that as a success. How messed up is our society when that is considered a success? When that tragedy, people applaud it. And when it's justified by their job is hard. If you want another real hard case of this, go ahead and take a look at the satanic ritualistic abuse cases that, that apparently occurred in the 80s and 90s. Do you remember those Satanists who were just molesting kids all the time? It didn't happen actually. But there was a 1,000 different satanic ritualistic abuses that have supposedly occurred in daycares and facilities across America. It was this, uh, this fear-mongering campaign by an author who wrote a book called Michelle Remembers. In it, what they found was that all these CPS investigators were being trained to deal with satanic abuse. So they would ask leading questions. You know, little Tommy uh, told me that uh, Diane, the daycare worker, is... Um, is touching you guys with brooms and is jumping around the room and, and touching everyone's penises and cutting people. L little Tommy's a good kid. I really like Tommy. I'm really glad he answered that. In fact, we're going to go play right afterwards because of that. Uh, are you like Tommy? Are you a good kid? Can you tell me yes? Actual questions. I actually looked up the studies on this. There's recordings of them saying these things. And dozens of people went to jail for this. Now, after some legitimate FBI investigations, they found that every single one of these reports is incorrect and they were insane. Did you guys know Chuck Norris came from hell? Like, came through a gate, and he chopped the baby in half. I mean, there's no physical evidence of a baby being chopped in half or Chuck Norris's awesome black belt being in there, but according to them, it, it occurred. And what's brought up with these is that there's a few bad apples in these cases, but that's simply not true. It's systemic, and it has to do with the way they gather evidence. So I'm at a, investigating a case and I get a call in that there's some abuse. An uncle overheard two years ago that supposedly a dad was smoking pot at his friend's house. He heard this from someone else. So my evidence is based off the evidence off of the hearsay of someone else from two years ago and that is considered good enough to get a removal and ruin a family's life. That is what they use. The perfect example of how to kind of bring up how preposterously stupid this is. And I realize I curse a bunch, by the way, but really, I mean, is the word fuck worse than the terrorist actions these people are doing? I don't think so. So the telephone game. I go to a classroom and I tell a kid three to four words. Um, Jack likes red cars. He says that to one kid, says to another kid, says to another kid, says to another kid, and then you have about 10 different kids. It all occurs in about 30 seconds. By the end of it, it's Rick loves The Walking Dead. Right? It's a completely different statement. Now think about that, but on a two-year span. right? And then also think about the incentives that they have to lie. Do you know one of the easiest ways to end a divorce case and get, get your divorce case moved straight to family court like that? If the wife says the dad was molesting the kids. If you think that doesn't happen, well, sadly, you guys don't realize how many bad people live out there. Because what occurs is, instead of it just being dealt in divorce court, which can take six to seven months, we immediately move to strong allegations of abuse. They can't be allowed with them. One of the hardest things to prove and disprove, and here's the thing, here's what's really, really messed up about those fake sexual assault charges, is that people will use those as cases of, well, kids really aren't being molested. There are tens of thousands of children who are being regularly molested. And every single time one of these false allegations comes out, it's the worst thing that can happen to the people who are really being abused. Because it makes them have to be questioned time and time again. And there's nothing worse than making them relive the trauma. But because we live in the world that we do with the incentives that are here, we're forced to. Divorce court, one way that they're incentivized. Other ways, a neighbor doesn't like how loud the other neighbor is, so he says sexual or physical abuse is occurring over there. Or, 
because the definition of abuse is so broad, you can actually just tell the truth and say, you know, John smokes pot. Oh, removal. That even works in California, Colorado, and in Washington where I'm helping out people's cases right now. Even though it is legal, it's still considered abuse. This stuff might come off as slightly conspiratorial or cynical, but the fact of the matter is, it's even worse because of the financial incentives. Due to the 1997 State Family Adoption Act by my favorite president ever, Bill, beautiful Clinton, uh, foster homes are granted, and actually Child Protective Services is granted directly nationally. The way Child Protective Services works is it has different names in different places in Massachusetts, DCYF, it's DCSS, in Vermont, um, just depends on your place, but it's still a federal organization that grants money back to the state. So we'll give you four to six grand for every single child that is swiftly removed from one home to another. It was supposed to prevent kids from being in foster homes for too long, but you know, parents do kind of have rights. How does this work though with mental disabilities? Well, if your child has a mental disability, the foster home's actually granted more money. What happens there? I'm a kid, I've just been taken out of a home, out of my school, out of my church, out of my community and I'm placed into a place where I'm being regularly abused maybe by the parents of the other kids there. I can't sleep, I can't think. I'm argumentative, for good reason. But according to a state health pr practitioner, I have oppositional defiance disorder, which all libertarians have, ADHD, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, and insomnia. I knew seven-year-old kids with seven different psychotropic drugs. They were zombies. This is, and every single time, they're given more money. And for every single drug that kids gets on, he shuts up more and more and sleeps more and more, which means that foster home can take in more and more kids. When you start to reflect on all these thoughts and when you, when you start to try to put it together, it's so unbelievably easy to become cynical and sad. And there's reasons to be. But in between the, the doom and gloom, what can occur is that you start to conceptualize how do we get out of this. And it's by getting rid of the mindset where we're supposed to go away from critical thinking, which is called faith-based thinking. It's a belief in spite of or in contradiction to reason and evidence. It is the very basis of the state and corrupt religions and corrupt forms of parenting. Once you acknowledge the fact that there are no good people out there, there's no good police people, there's no good military, there are no good child protective service investigators out there, they're just people and every single thing they do is inevitable for we are all manipulated, consciously or unconsciously. Every time we hear an advertisement, we hear a howdy instead of a hi, we go into an air-conditioned store, we hear something described as hoppy instead of bitter, we read a uh, Facebook notification. Every single one of those times, we're being regularly manipulated with every word, every action, every fleeting thought, every event manipulates our consciousness. And that's not always a bad thing, for almost every action we do in our life is to manipulate our consciousness. We go outside for a run to just be happy. We hang out with our friends in wonderful communities like we're in right now to be happy. But the fact of the matter is, we're just animals. We don't have consciousness in a vat. There is no true free will. There is no going against incentives. After a certain amount of time due to ego depletion, there's only so much we can do. It's all due to the course of nature of the state, the gun behind the ignorance, the limitations on human understanding, and the belief in religious moralistic judgments against the idea of enjoyment as a whole. When I decided to work for CPS while I was in college, in fact, when I was just in college, I basically made the decision that I'd be dealing with mortality on a day-to-day -day basis. When I counseled molested children, when I became an investigator, when I became a whistleblower, when I started the LLC, Child Protective Services Victim Support, when I started helping out families time and time again, and when I decided to write Legally Kidnap, the case against Child Protective Services, I decided to come face to face with death on a daily basis. It's impossible when you're holding a parent who's crying in your arms because her child died in a foster home because she got caught smoking pot. You can't ignore it in that case. But once you have a 
acknowledgement that you only have a limited amount of time in this concrete rock that is spinning around a flying star, you start to acknowledge the importance of having concrete values and the importance of figuring out what's actually in your sphere of influence right now. I'm going to finish up with something I wrote after uh, I had uh, one friend die in a car crash and uh, another friend commit suicide and then I knew a couple of other people who had died to foster homes within about a month. Not exactly the best time to be thinking, but it was the time when I had the most amount of time to reflect. And it was right before I decided to write my book because I realized something had to change. The ultimate destiny of all living things is death. It's the one guarantee. The denial of this existential reality means nothing to death, but it doesn't keep it from creeping forward inch by inch by car crash or cancer. We can choose to endlessly contemplate and fear it or shut off dealing with the fact, the fact that you're going to die one day. Birth is the alpha and death is the omega and life is the part in between. In between the beginning and the end is choice. We can choose to quiver only living by word and not by action or to act which we can do with passion and commitment if we choose to. We can choose fabrication or we can choose authenticity. Hell, as I've come to understand, is believing we have no choice. And it seems that those who believe we have little choice want to endlessly restrict it. The gatekeepers of freedom attempt to absolve their own insignificance by propelling themselves forward under the guise of leadership while stepping over the heads of others, crippling groups while damning themselves. They do not just use guns, but words which are just as powerful. Some promise eternity, some others prosperity. But they're just as confused as all of us, if not more so. Because their preconceived, their confusion is truth and back their truth with threats. We can only control ourselves. We can only steer others. It is not the fear of death that I ask you to consider. It is a fear of a meaningless night life. Meaning comes from acknowledging the former and accepting our part to play in the latter. It means accepting what you can control and not stewing in aggravation about what you cannot. You have a sphere of choice and suffering comes when we devote our lives and admire that which is outside our sphere. It is an intellectual and emotional battle that we all fight where we seek to control uncontrollable externalities while ignoring and diminishing ourselves diminishing what little time we have in our life. Helping people with family court is within my sphere of control, writing about it and educating others through my podcasts and books that I write. I want to simply ask of all of you, think about what's in your actual sphere of influence. Is it trying to get politicians to vote against the Fed? Or is it living a happier life and educating those around you and not just strolling around on Facebook all day yelling at your uncle because he's a statist? Accept the fact that we're going to go one day and be happy for it because then we can acknowledge what we can do next to make our lives better before it's all gone. Thank you very much.